Hi, folks. Professor Rick Rapetti here again. This is my second lecture on Indian philosophy. The first was about the mythic era. It was a very general overview. And this one is a little bit more in depth about Hinduism. So it's kind of like an introduction to Hinduism, right? And now my next lecture on this subject of Indian philosophy and Hinduism will be on the six orthodox schools of thought or philosophies in Hinduism. But today is a kind of general overview without getting into the six schools. I'll mention one or two of them today, but um, let me share a screen, get my PowerPoint up here. Here it is. Okay, let's start the slideshow. Great, so there you have it. Hinduism, ancient Orthodox Indian philosophy from the Vedas. What makes a philosophy Orthodox in Indian philosophy is whether or not it's based on the Vedas, which are the ancient scriptures. And there's a picture of the god Vishnu, the preserver of the universe who intervenes uh, by sending avatars of himself into the physical world. And that's why there's pictures of him with many different heads uh, one is an elephant, one is a monkey, various humans and whatnot, um, because when God intervenes in the world, he comes in whatever form is useful for the beings in the world at that time. That's the idea. An avatar is an introduction of the God Vishnu, the preserver of the universe, into the universe. There's that picture, okay? So... What might have seemed like a crazy picture, what kind of God has a lots of heads and lots of arms, it's symbolic. It's, it's not really um, literal, okay? So once again, I think I mentioned this in my previous lecture, the word Hindu comes from the Indus and India, India, Indus River, it's all the same, right? And there's a big picture, the bottom triangle on your screen in the darker green, um, is modern day India, and you see Pakistan upper left, Afghanistan further to the left, Iran further to the left, and up toward the right, you have Nepal and Myanmar and Bhutan and Tibet, and you know, in ancient India, or like kind of stretched across all of those regions, right? And then broke up into countries in the, in the 20th century and whatnot. Oh, and Sri Lanka at the bottom of the screen is an island just off the shore of India which is considered uh, part of ancient India, although it's a separate country now. It used to be called Ceylon, C-E-Y-L-O-N, okay? So thousands of philosophies in India, thousands of religions, thousands of traditions, thousands of paths to enlightenment or to God. And that's a beautiful multicolored Hindu temple over there. You see statues of gods all over India. The name of a statue of God is a Murti, M-U-R-T-I. Okay, so uh, we're overviewing Hinduism, and you've got several different religious slash philosophical periods, right? The earliest one is the Vedic period, um, which is the period that the Vedas and the Upanishads were written, and the Upanishads are not distinct from the Vedas, but they're given that name. They are the later Vedas, okay? So sometimes people treat them as if they're different, but they're really not. It's just that the Upanishads is like chapter two in a two chapter book and the Vedas are really both, but you get it. You get the point. Uh, of course, by the way, before we go on to the next bullet, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, these were passed on orally for hundreds of years, at least if not thousands of years for all we know, orally, father to son, Brahmin, father to Brahmin son, you're born into the caste of Brahminhood. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's the earliest period, right, which predates them being written down. And then there's the epic period, during which time big epics, you know, epic sagas were written down. These are like Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey, these tremendous stories, right? Um, the Ramayana, which is like the tales of the god Rama, when the god Vishnu incarnated as Rama, right? Um, and the Mahabharata, it's Maha means great, and Bharat was a king, the great king Bharat. Um, 
uh, one of the parts of which is the most beloved Hindu scripture nowadays called the Bhagavad Gita, which I mentioned in the last one, which means the song of God. Bhagavad is a name for God or Lord, and Gita is song. And these are very popularized. You can see probably films of the Ramayana or the Mahabharata, um, uh, if you look them up on the internet, really fascinating stuff epic stories. Um, and just like with the Iliad and the Odyssey, which, um, if you recall, Homer's epic poems were the scriptural source for Greek values, religion, culture, right? Although the Vedas are the, the primary source, the epics are more popularly known, right? Maybe philosophers and Brahmins study the Vedas and the Upanishads, and the other scriptures, there are layers and layers of them. But the average Indian uh, grew up on the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana, the Mahabharata. They know them. Um, and that's where most of their, uh, their culture comes from. And then there's the later period of philosophical systems, both orthodox and non-orthodox or unorthodox or heterodox, which I explained in the last one. Orthodox means based on the Vedas, Heterodox, non-orthodox, or multiply dox, dox means belief, recall, um, are the other religions that sprang up there, were influenced by orthodox, but uh, might have been reactions to them. Uh, and these come in various sutras, like the yoga sutras of the great Indian sage and yogi Patanjali, or the sutras, uh, so, sometimes the word is translated as sayings or words but threads, meaning discourses, lines of reasoning about something is a sutra. The Kama Sutra is the sutra on sensuality, sex, and eroticism. Kama means something like flesh or body. Um, so the sutras are these kind of treatises that, would, that contain doctrines and arguments and dialogues and stuff like that. Okay, so this is the later, right? We've got the Vedas, we've got the epics, then we've got the philosophical treatises or the sutras, that period, and then commentaries on them, which comes even later, right? Philosophical arguments in defense of the doctrines in the sutras or the sayings in the sutras. And then the modern period. This is still alive. Unlike, I mentioned this last time, unlike Greek myth, Indian or Hindu myth is still alive and still being practiced. It's a living religion, right? So nowadays, in the last hundred years or so, even uh, even in the last in my lifetime, there are gurus and there's some of them that are still al alive and and so on. We'll hear more about that now. But modern, contemporary, living gurus, saints, and philosophers. This tradition, once again, is a living one. Okay, so let's start. We we'll go back to the first one: the Vedas, the four major Vedas not the Upanishads, the Vedas. The Rig Veda is the oldest one. And those are hymns, like a hymnal in church. You open up and you read the prayers and you sing them, right? Or mantras or incantations, right? Um, the the Yajur Veda is formulas recited by priests. So the, the, only the priests really um, enunciate or you know perform these verbal rituals, right? And um, so is the Samaveda, the third one, and the Atharva Veda is more like spells, incantations, and charms, right? So like all of them are very ritualistic. And, and what is the word? I think I might have used this in my last lecture. Like the priest in his dialogue with Socrates describes piety and holiness that the whole, what is, it's what the holy man does or the holy woman in reciting prayers, performing rituals, making sacrificial offerings, tending to the gods, to the temples, to the statues of the gods, all that stuff is this worship, worshipful attitude of human beings, priests, holy women, whatever, you know, um, kind of propitiating, appealing to the gods, you know, giving and receiving to and from the gods, offering things to them, getting the blessings back, right? But in the Vedas, this attitude was that the priesthood, it's their job to uphold the cosmic order by performing these things. It's like, it's like I think I made the analogy of the uh, conductor on an old locomotive who's got to keep shoveling coal into the furnace to keep it going, right? And steer it, right? This is what the priests do. 
they're 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 putting spiritual coal into the fire of the universe in a way and literally using fire in all their ceremonies and incense and burning you know whatnot chanting the mantras which are you know commands almost like if you gave a command to your computer if it's the kind that could list siri you tell siri what to do right you've got to be able to speak the right way to siri so that siri understands you these are the mantras that the godhead understands and keeps the universe functioning when the priests do them right so it's kind of magical okay um oh, hold on one moment i gotta just kind of see about something in my way here on my screen Okay, the Vedas involve mostly magical rituals, right? Like I just said, but we'll say a little bit more about them. A puja, this word, P-U-J-A, is the name for a ritual ceremony, right? That you perform. It's, uh, the word karma literally means action in Sanskrit, right? But in, in the translation in the West, it's more, it, it, it's a more comprehensive thing than just action. It's action and all the consequences of the action. And in the West, we say, oh, you have good karma or bad karma. We're talking about the consequences of your, your karmic credit, which is the consequences. You do good deeds, you have good karma. It's like karmic credit built up in your karma storehouse or something like that, right? But the word karma originally is focusing on actions that you perform, right? So when you perform pujas, you are creating good karma in this belief system. Right. And um, it's a kind of power, which is a power to do certain things and to transform the world. Right. To transform yourself and to transform the world, to keep it orderly, cosmic. Rita, R-I-T-A is the cosmic order. Right. They are directed to the spirits, the angels, the, the gods. Right. Like Agni uh, is the fire god. Okay, and the fire is always burning in almost all of these There's always candles or something burning and incense burning right propitiating you're offering fire to the fire God, so to speak. They're in Sanskrit they're formulas their spells their magic potions like that sort of thing and mantras are things that you repeat over and over again and it's believed that the more you do a mantra, the more power it develops. It's like the more you work a muscle at the gym, the bigger that muscle gets. Right. So it's the same thing. Or like um, neural signatures, the more you think a certain kind of thought, it creates a pathway in your mind. And so it's something like that. The pathway between your soul and the cosmic soul is strengthened. The more you use the same mantra, you create a mantra pathway. It's believed something like that. Or you're connecting with the, the realm from which that mantra emanated. Right. The sound of the universe, Om. The more you chant Om, the more it connects you with the Om level of the universe, that level where everything is vibrating. Mm. <laughs> right? So, this is the way uh, it's thought about. All right. And food is offered. Uh, you might see this in, in other Asian cultures, like in Chinese, um, you know, fruits and incense in, in front of a statue of a Buddha or something like that. Right? So, when you offer food to the gods, it's like in a Catholic or Christian mass when the priest blesses food, the bread and the wine with the sign of the cross, right? The priest has the power to transform it from ordinary food into spiritualized food, right? And Christians believe that they, they turn the body and uh, they turn the bread into the body and the wine into the blood of Jesus. Because in the Last Supper, Jesus said, you know, have the bread and wine and do it. And this is my body and this is my blood. Right, this kind of thing. Um, so the same belief is is uh, predates Christianity, but the Brahmins transform. They offer by offering the food to the gods. The gods eat some of the spiritual energy. They take some of it to be, um, you know, uh, courteous on the receiving end. They take it, but then they bless what's left, and um, you know the uh, the food becomes holy. Right, just like. Um, the Eucharist, as it's called in the Christian mass, right? The body and blood of Jesus, then this becomes like the body of God, right? And um, it's called prasad. Once food has been blessed in a, in a puja, it becomes prasad, and you eat the prasad to improve yourself in the same way that when you take communion in church, uh, you have the, the wafer or the wine or both, whatever. It's the same idea. Right. And so RR, that's me, Rick Repetti. I'm reminding you, this is a Euthyphro style religious activity. 
Euthyphro in the dialogue called the Euthyphro by Plato, where Socrates is arguing with that priest, asking him what's piety, what's holiness, and, and Euthyphro's final just definition was this kind of thing, right? Tending to the gods, serving the gods. Okay, yeah, they'll often have a fire pit with a big fire. Uh, back in the Vedic period, right, they would drink the soma, which was a psychedelic liquid, um, burn incense, have visions of the gods, commune, spirit travel, whatever you want to call it, while they were performing these magical ceremonies, right? And then they would hear a mantra, and it would be believed that that came from the universe, and they would speak that mantra. And, and that's how um, the Vedas themselves were originally crafted, drafted, produced, emanated, uh, received, whatever you want to call it, right? But then the, co the continuity throughout the generations, the pujas, even people perform them today, are to connect with this same eternal spirit, okay? Yes, you're invoking the gods, you're petitioning the gods, you're feeding the gods, um, spirits, gods, whatever you want to call them, right? To support and maintain dharma, right? Uh, your own duty. It's your duty to do that. I should have really, it should say to support and maintain Rita, cosmic order, but it's your dharma to do that. And sometimes the two things are blended together. Um, you know, your dharma is like your role in the cosmic order. Yeah, so it's, they're kind of related. So there's a picture of uh, a Brahmin performing, um, it, two people there performing some kind of ritual puja, okay? So here's a sample of some philosophy in the Rig Veda. That's the first one, the earliest one. It's not like all they are is a book of spells, right? There's some philosophy in there. So here's some fit sample philosophical questioning from the, the Rig Veda. Maybe God, who looks down from the highest heaven, doesn't know about the beginning of the universe. Now think about that. That's a kind of philosophical speculation about the origin of the universe, whether God created the universe consciously, or he was present, or, right? What does that mean? That being must be eternal, right? Like, it implies that God predates the beginning of the universe so anciently that he might not have even noticed the universe being created. Gods are not eternal, maybe, right? Whatever it is, it's some kind of philosophical speculation. What might it mean, right? Maybe, right? That the word maybe tells you it's a philosophical possibility, but which one? God, who looks down from the highest heaven, doesn't know about the beginning. It could mean, like I already went over a couple of different, but maybe it just means like he wasn't around. That's how old the universe is or the beginning was, or the current God is a recent God because in this system, it's believed that reincarnation happens. An ant can eventually become a God and a God, if they perform karmically the wrong way, can become an ant, right? There are stories about that. Uh, Indra, one of the chief gods in one of the stories, gets reborn as an ant because he had an ego problem or something like that. All right, yeah, they reincarnate, they change form, the gods. Maybe the gods weren't even at the beginning. And so these are deep philosophical questions going back thousands of years. Okay, let's move on to the Upanishads. And there's a book by Penguin Classics with a picture of... Um, some kind, of, I think that might be the god Shiva, yes, because I see a trident in the god's, the god's right hand, which is on our left. That's that three-pointed stick. Um, and the dance posture of the legs is a standard um, depiction of the god Shiva. In any event, the Upanishads are very yogic, unlike the earlier Vedas are all very Euthyphro style. We approach God, we make offerings to God, we give to God in the hopes of receiving from God to keep everything working, to keep our place, to do our duty and all that kind of thing, right? To be upright, righteous, priest-like beings, right? But the Upanishads are more yogic. They're more about spiritual enlightenment, right? There's over 200 of them. Oh yes, an Upanishad means 
I think I said in my previous lesson, something like come close or sit near, I forget what, what the exact literal translation is, but it means something like come close and listen or sit down or sometimes it's sit at the feet of the guru. The guru is the teacher. By the way, guru means darkness and light. So the guru takes you from darkness to the light. Um, okay, once again, they're the end of the Vedas. They're the latest Vedas. So the word Vedanta, uh, which is the name of a school of philosophy, one of the six orthodox schools, but it also means the end of the Vedas. Right, so sometimes the Upanishads are referred to as the Vedanta, right, or Vedanta, just philosophy of the, the later Vedas, right? The earlier Vedas were ritualistic, the later is more philosophical, Vedanta, right? It's all about Brahman, the cosmic soul, and Atman, the individual soul, the individual soul seeking knowledge about karma and rebirth and freedom. Moksha means freedom. That S with the dot under it is pronounced like a sh, like an SH. Sometimes it's just spelled that way, SH, right? But self realization, realizing that the soul, the self, the individual is one with the all, the one, there's only one, right? Brahman, right? So this is called self realization or seeking the self, right? The Upanishads are in search of the true nature of the self, being, being that you're not just the individual like a wave, you're the whole ocean. Right? And you've been confused to think that you're just a wave by getting the right kind of knowledge and by practicing meditation and yogic, other yogic practices, the soul can become one with the all, with the one, right? Self-realization through yoga and meditation practices. And some of the ethics that comes out of that is nonviolence because we're all the same, we're all one. So compassion, and charity, and self-control, all of those things make sense if you believe we're all the same one being right? We're not at odds with each other. Okay, so here's a sample. We gave you a sample philosophical question in the earlier Vedas, like was God at the beginning? Here's a sample philosophical argument in one of the most uh, popular Upanishads. It's been said that in the beginning there was non-being, like at first there was nothing, right? Before the world, there was nothing, right? Kind of makes sense. Right? But listen to this. But being can't come out of non-being. Does that ring a bell? So if you're in the class and not just watching this later on on the internet, you'll recall this line of reasoning from our ancient Greek philosopher friend Parmenides. Right? You can't get something from nothing. Something can't emerge out of nothing. Right? Compare Parmenides, CF, confer, compare in French. Therefore, being must have always been, right? And I think I might have made that argument myself when I was explaining Parmenides. Being exists now. There's a something. Here we are. Look around. You're watching a something, listening to a something. You are a something. There's a something. Whatever the world is, you know, even if it's a matrix or a virtual world, it doesn't matter. There's something. Something can't come from absolutely nothing, right? That's what it says on the second bullet. Being cannot emerge from non-being. Something can't come from nothing. Therefore, if there was ever a moment of nothing, there could never be anything after that. But if there is a something, then there always had to be a something. There never could have been a beginning. Um, and by beginning, we hear mean, in this case, moving from nothing, no world, to something, a world. All right? So this is a brilliant, brilliant argument. Ancient Upanishad. Okay, so now let's move into the epics. I'm only going to talk about one, I think, the Ramayana, which is the story of the god Rama. That's the blue guy in the background there. Um, his consort, uh, it's a fancy word for a wife-like relationship, Sita, his brother Lakshman, and the monkey in the front is Hanuman, right? And um, Rama is an incarnation of the god Vishnu, Right, I would imagine that Sita is an incarnation of the Divine Mother. Um, you've got all, all these different complications in this. Um, I forget who Lakshman might be an incarnation of, but Hanuman is believed to be an incarnation of the god Shiva. So we say, oh, normally it's Vishnu who uh, 
whenever there's an avatar, it's Vishnu, but sometimes the other gods appear in the world too, just for fun, right? So here Shiva uh, is incarnate allegedly as the monkey god Hanuman, um, an avatar of Shiva. Oh, and I, at the, my last bullet there, <clears throat> there was a yogi guru sage holy man who lived up until the early 1970s, I think, 71 or 70, I forget when he died, named Nimkaroli Baba in modern, uh, in India, um, also known as Maharaji, but that's a very popular nickname in India. It means sweet, a great king. It's a, it's a term of endearment. When you, uh, Maharaj means great, Maha Raj, the Raj is the king. Maha is great, like in Mahatma Gandhi. Atma means soul, right? Great soul. It's a title, Mahatma. Um, so yeah, Maharaji, when you add the G at the end, it's a term of endearment, right? So um, I'll say more about Maharaji, about Nimkaroli Baba later, but I'll say one thing right now. His devotees believed that he was a reincarnation or an incarnation of Hanuman, the monkey god. All right, so it's a, it's a fascinating story, the Ramayana. Um, I won't say anything else about it, except that you should probably go and watch it if you could find it. There's got to be a version of it. Even if it has subtitles, it's worth watching or reading at some point. Um, it's kind of like the Iliad, like an Indian version of, you know, it's, it's an epic thing. Okay. Um, oh, yes, that's that. And then there's a picture of the Mahabharata. Um, the Bhagavad Gita is part of the Mahabharata, the, the, the great King Bharat story, right? But it's, it's, it's about a war that, you know, millions of people die in and it lasts for, I forget how many years, hundreds of years or something like that. This epic, epic, epic battle with all the reasons why and everything, just like the Trojan War is like, there's this great story, right? Uh, that has a million moral and spiritual things in the Trojan War story right? Like the Trojan horse thing, you know, um, and so on. But uh, in this one, in the Bhagavad Gita, which is the most popular Hindu scripture, the god Krishna standing there upright with his hand up in the air, he's lecturing that fellow on his knee, um, which is the great warrior Arjuna, right? And Arjuna is about to go into battle and um, He's got his warriors on one side and the opponents on the other, but he recognizes many of the opponents, their cousins and friends and relatives and neighbors, you know, but unfortunately, you know, this, if you knew the whole soap opera of it, the reasons why they're divided and about to go to war, and he feels a kind of what I'll call a Buddhist or a Jain-like sensation, this feeling of oneness, where uh, he has compassion, he doesn't want to kill them, and Krishna, the god, who's the, like Rama, was an incarnation of Vishnu, so is Krishna, right, in this later story. So the god, Krishna, is telling Arjuna, look, you're a soul, you're eternal, they're souls, they're eternal, this is karma, it's got to be, this is what you do, you're, a, you're also a warrior, you're in the warrior caste, the kshatriya class, caste, and this is your dharma, it's your duty to be a warrior and not... Uh, not sure your responsibilities. It's like it's a parent's responsibility to raise their children. It's a Brahmin's responsibility to, to do the pujas and uphold the cosmic order, the Rita, right? So, you know, get over it. Do what you got to do. And, uh, you know, don't worry about the karma. As long as you're doing what you do because it's your duty and you're doing the right thing for the right reasons because you have faith in the universe and in the, the laws of karma and how everything works, do what you do, but leave the consequences of your actions up to me. Don't worry about who gets hurt, whatnot. That, that's not your concern. Your concern is to do your duty. You're a warrior. Now go to war, right? Be the best warrior that you can, right? And then there's this idea of karma yoga, which is the path. Yoga is a path to union. The word yoga means to yoke, to unite, to make one, right? So there are different paths, different yogas, different roads to union to yoga are called yogas right karma yoga is the philosophy that krishna is teaching him that if you do your dharma your duty don't do it looking for the results don't don't do good deeds looking to gain good karma 
do whatever you have to do, whatever is your duty, or just carry out, do the right thing because it's the right thing and don't worry about the consequences. Leave the karmic consequences to me, right? I'm God, I'll take care of it, right? And in this, Krishna also talks about three other major paths to God in the Bhagavad Gita, right? So there's the karma, karma path, the one I just described, there's the bhakti path, which is the one that the Vedic priests have. They're just worshiping God, the path of devotion and worship, the priestly life, right? The Brahmin's life. Um, there's the path of knowledge, philosophical reflection, meditation, all that kind of stuff, right? And those are the those are the three main ones: devotion. Oh, calm, yeah, de devotion, meditation, and knowledge karma right those are the main karma yoga um jnana jnana yoga it's the path of knowledge and bhakti yoga is the path of devotion right um later on some philosophers one that we're going to talk about later um broke down the knowledge path into two components and made the one that's just the one about meditation and call that the raja yoga or kingly yoga Right, and we'll talk more about it later. Okay, so now we're going to move move past the epic period to the period of the uh, the sutras and the great philosophers. Right, um, I'm not going to differentiate between the philosophers and the commentators so much, but we can consider philosophers in the in the in the in our lifetime and commentators for the most part, but not not entirely. So here are the three great. Vedanta philosophers, philosophers lecturing on how the soul is one with God, or maybe not exactly, right? Um, Shankara, the first one on the left, these are very popular pictures of them. So in Indians will know who they are by looking at these pictures, even if they kind of look alike to you. Um, the second one really is the one on the far right, chronologically, Madhava, um, Madhava or Madhava, M-A-D-H-V-A or W-A. The V and the W are often pronounced the same way. Um, even I have uh, friends from Pakistan who, who, who say, um, I saw a video instead of a video. Or they'll say, um, they'll pronounce a W as a V. You know, why do you do that? You know, that kind of thing. So um, the W and the V are kind of, interchangeable often in it. So it's Madhava or Madhava. And Acharya is added at the end. There, Acharya means teacher, right? And Ramanuja in the middle. So I believe Shankara uh, argued for monism. Madhava uh, argued for dualism, right? Monism means only one, no, non-duality. Madhava says, no, no, there's God and there's one, and we're kind of separate from God. Right. And then Ramanuja says, well, no, like there's one and we're kind of separate from God, but it's all still one. Right. Whatever. I uh, will say a little bit more about them in a, in a moment. But the difference between them all is how many beings are there? This is a fundamental metaphysical question. Right. And there's a whole school of Indian philosophy, which has to do with how many things are there. Right. Uh, it's called the enumeracy, um, the school of numbers, so to speak. Shankara, Madhava and Ramanuja. Right. OK, so, yeah, Shankara, Charya, sometimes I'll just add Acharya at the end. Great teacher. Right. Um, Shankara is also a name for the god Shiva. Right. So this is called Advaita. Right. And Dvaita means dualistic or dualism. And remember, the, the V can be pronounced as a W. So Dvaita, duo in Italian or dos in Spanish or dual in English, right? It comes from the Sanskrit. Dvaita or Dvaita means dual or two-ish somehow or another, one, two, right? Ah, you put an A in front of something like the word theist is someone who believes in God. You put an A in front of it, you get atheist, right? Don't believe in God. So Advaita is non-dualistic. That means there's only one. There's no two, right? Everything is Brahman. The separation of us from each other and from God and the fingers on my hand from the fingers on your hand, all that stuff is an illusion. And the word for this kind of cosmic illusion is Maya, 
Maya means cosmic illusion. The whole universe is a kind of virtual reality, according to Hinduism, right? To this view, it's an illusion because it appears, this is what Parmenides said, ironically, it seems like there's plurality of things and that they're changing and all of that, that there's multiple things, the many, but there's really only one. All there is is being, Parmenides said. This is a very similar view. I wonder if they were in communication with each other. And in fact, there is a book called The Dark Places of Wisdom by a fellow named something or other Kingsley, I think his last name was, in The Dark Places of Wisdom makes the argument that Parmenides was influenced by this and had access to it, aged from Asia Minor or something. All right. Madhava believed in dualism, right? Dwaita or Dvaita, right? There's an eternal being but it's distinct, right? There are distinctions. There's the natural world, which is made out of matter, and then there are souls, and there's Brahman, and they are all distinct, right? And the, the, this dualistic attitude that we are not all the same as God. We might be made in the image and likeness of God. Our souls are like little droplets of God, but we're not waves in the ocean where we're the ocean and we're not the wave, right? No, we're the waves. Madhava is saying, right? And that attitude is what you have in the Western monotheistic religions, right? At best, at best, you are a wave, you are not the ocean of God, right? It's, a, it's almost a heresy or sinful to think, I am God, right? What are you, nuts? You're going to get burned at the stake, right? Okay. So Ramanuja, I'm only going to go through these things, overview, right? We just want you to have an overview. Later in the later lectures, we'll get in, into the nitty gritty of this stuff. But Ramanuja uh, argues for this combination, uh, vishista, which means something like a combination uh, of vaita, dvaita and advaita, right? So he combines both. The one and the many are really one. There's a many, the many are real. They are distinct from the one, but ultimately they're still the one, right? He's a kind of compromise guy, um, Ramanuja. So these are the three greatest, um, you know, in the philosophical period, uh, post-Vedic, pre-modern Indian philosophers. Okay, so philosophies are called darshanas. Even though there's just an S there, it's pronounced darshanas. It's plural, darshan or darshans. Um, often it's just called darshan in English. And the word literally means vision, not takes, but it's kind of like a take on reality. What's your perspective, your worldview, what's your paradigm, what's your model of reality, what's your take on reality, right? Your perspective, do you take from where you're looking, right? They literally mean visions, right? But informally, it's a philosophy. And there are six philosophical systems, in, right? But there are many. There are six orthodox schools, I should say, six orthodox darshans, right? But there are many, many. There are thousands of different perspectives on religion and philosophy in India. But here's a common belief that if you meet a saint or a holy person or a guru or an enlightened being or maybe even a Brahmin, right, um, that you're getting a glimpse of God, a little bit of a vision of God. You're seeing some manifestation or emanation to use a neoplatonic idea, right? God is emanating through that holy person right? and you're getting a darshan of God, right? And people go to get darshan, they call it. I'm going for darshan. I want to go see the saint, that kind of thing and get a blessing, right? So um, yes, so, but there are these six Vedic Orthodox darshans, meaning philosophies, right? Or schools of thought. And the word astika means it's real, right? Aste means something like being, it exists, right? Astika is some kind of a verb form or, or adjective based on being, right? It's kind of has reality or something like that. I'm not the linguist here, but it means something. And when you say namaste, nama means something like I bow, aste to the, to the being that is you, right? So astika means it has being, it's real. It's orthodox. Um, yeah, it exists. It's real. Why? Because it's a direct emanation from God, right? The Vedas come from God and from Brahman itself, right? Um, Nastika means unreal, right? Okay. 
So the Vedas are considered of divine origin, right? Like the scriptures, like the Quran, the um, Muhammad says that the angel Gabriel, which is a biblical angel of the Jews and Christians, came to him in a cave and dictated the Islamic scripture, the Quran, to him, right? And uh, allegedly he was um, illiterate, right? So this is, uh, and, and, and the language of the Quran is believed to be just like the kind of holy speak in the Iliad, right? Or the Vedas are supposed to be divine language emanating directly from like the mind of God or something like that. The Quran is believed to be that way, right? So the Vedas are believed to be that way, that the holy men, the seers, right? The, the ones who first saw or heard it, right? The Vedas, that makes it like a divine revelation, right? And the word for something directly heard from a see, seen or heard from a, one of the seers is called Shruti, right? So that the status of Shruti means it's divine revelation. It's God, -like. God said it, right? Um, and then there's later like commentators by people like Madhava, Ramanuja, or Shankara, right? Or in an oral tradition, things being passed down that that's just uh, remembered. Like I remember my, my Brahmin teacher taught me this and now I'm teaching you or something like that, right? So this is stuff that's, uh, it's a kind of epistemological stamp, right? Shruti is something that's directly heard from God, right? God said that's Shruti, right? That's, all, that, that's totally um, the strongest epistemological stamp that you could put on something in terms of the quality of its knowledge and its validity, right? One level down is smrti, right? Smrti, which means remembrance, right? And in fact, meditation is called smrti, right? In Sanskrit, um, in a way, remembering your being, right? Remembering being itself, going into that mode, right? Because the truth is already there, okay? Um, yeah, less valid epistemologically, but still valid. It's, to make an analogy, it's something like, if you know about the Talmud and the Torah, the Torah is the Jewish Bible, and that's considered divine revelation because the prophets are like the seers, right? So that would be Shruti, right? The Torah, the Bible itself is Shruti, divine speech, right? Revelation from God through prophets or seers, right? Smriti, what's remembered is the holy men, generation after generation, who are analyzing the revelation and commentating on it and interpreting it, right? And passing on their understanding of what it means and how it's to be understood and how it's supposed to be interpreted and how it's supposed to be applied and what its implications are, right? That knowledge, once it's formulated, gets passed on, you right? So generation after generations of rabbis studying the Talmud and learning it and teaching it to their students or their children or whatever, right? Same thing over here. So it has that Talmudic scholarship is this kind of second rate smriti, remembrance stuff, orally transmitted ideas based on what was revealed. Okay. So yes, there are six that's that word shad, darshanas, right? Six of these philosophical visions that are uh, based on what was heard. So what was heard or seen by the seers is the revelation, that's um, shruti, right? And uh, what's remembered, what the philosophers think is smriti, remembrance. So these six forms of smriti, and on my analysis, are those are the names of the six orthodox or astika, it exists, schools or darshans or philosophies or visions, right? And there's the names over there. So I told you one of them is about how many things are there. Samkhya is one that enumerates everything. It says there's two kinds of things, right? So they're a dualistic school of thought, right? Um, purusha, which is consciousness or spirit or mind. Don't worry about the details, but just to, to get the main idea. And then matter, prakrit, or prakriti is matter. So there's mind and matter, or spirit and, and flesh, or something like that, okay? 
That's Samkhya. Yoga is about the union of the soul or the individual self with the cosmic self with a capital S, Brahman. Well, Atman and Brahman are the same. Atman is the self, Mahatma, the great soul. That's a way of remembering that word. Mahatma Gandhi is a great soul. Maha means great, and Atma means soul, with or without the end. Atma or Atman. In Bangladesh, the word is Atta, I believe. Um, okay, so that's the yoga school. And Nyaya is a logic school. The logicians, those are like the real philosophers. They have rules for logic, just like Aristotle, right? Aristotle invented logic. And there was people in this tradition who developed logic, argument forms, chains of inference, reasoning, right? They have their own little system of logic, which it's almost like to compare Roman numerals and Arabic numerals. I'm not saying that one is better than the other, even though when, when it comes to Arabic, Arabic numerals are better than Roman, but you can translate Roman numerals into Arabic numerals and vice versa, right? So logic is logic. So they might have different ways of approaching it, right? And symbolizing it and manipulating it, but logic is logic, so it translates, right? So the Nyayakas, as they're called, you put an IKA at the end, that means a follower of that school, right? They're logicians, just like Aristotle's logic. Okay, Vaisheshika, and those S's are like SH's, is uh, a metaphysical school, similar to Samkhya, which is a metaphysical school, saying there's two kinds of things, but their metaphysics is of atomism. Everything, like, like Democritus in the West, right? So you've got atomism in ancient Indian philosophy, Right, and they say that everything is made out of these tiny little things, atoms. Okay, um, Mimamsa is the one closest to the earliest Veda, which is all about rituals and interpreting them. Right, so that's like kind of really the early Vedic vision. Right, these are not in chronological order, but Vedanta is chronologically the later Upanishads. We've talked about that. That's a kind of philosophical thing. It's very similar to yoga. Right. It come, in fact, I think it combines uh, most of the above, but you know, it's its distinctive um, ideology. Right? Yoga, by the way, what's distinctive about yoga is that yoga is based on samkhya. Number two is based on number one. So number two takes in um, this idea of the mind and the body and uh, tries to control the body so that the soul part of it can escape from the body and reunite with the mind part. And it's really complicated, right? So, but yoga, number two, accepts the metaphysics of number one and works its yogic efforts in according to that model given by number one. Number six is more independent of the metaphysics. And the, it's only metaphysics is that it's, everything is either one or remember Shankara, everything is one. Madhava, no, there's two, there's the soul and there's God and they're not the same. Um, uh, and, and then number three, no, they're, they're distinct, but they're the same, Ramanuja. Okay, so that's Vedanta, Upanishad, very philosophical. And that, that might be another difference between number six and number two, right? Vedanta is highly philosophical. Number two, yoga is more like, almost like a auto mechanics of the soul. How do you get the soul out of the body and that kind of thing? Right, not as philosophical. Okay, so now we have um, heterodox darshans, you know, the unorthodox or non Vedic Nastika means unorthodox darshanas, right? And so you see that guy in red going the other way, that means he's unorthodox, right? He's, he's going the other way. What's wrong with that guy, right? Well, it's important that we have that kind of thing. In fact, that's what philosophy is all about. If you recall, Aristotle disagreed with Plato about the forms. And you know, each generation disagrees with the, the previous generation. So you've got some of that going on in Indian philosophy. In fact, you've got plenty of it going on. Once these unorthodox philosophies start appearing, they argue with the orthodox ones for centuries. And each side improves its game and its, its arguments and its philosophies by you know, um, bouncing them off of each other in debate. And they're literally serious debates um, that have historical consequences, right? Because wealthy kings or whatever, or, or benefactors would 
reward the one who won the, 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 the debate, right? Uh, or punish the ones who lost it. They have to disband their cult or whatever, that kind of thing. All right, so one of them, a jiva is a soul or a life force, right? Jiva. And a jivika is somebody who believes that the soul has a life force, right? Um, if, if you believe in the soul, then you're, a, you're not an ajivika, you're a jivika. But a ah in front of something negates it, like advaita, ah, right? Or atheist, right? So you believe that the soul has no power. You, you, you can't do anything. You, you're a fatalist. That's just a fancy word for being a fatalist. And they're not around anymore. But there was a powerful movement back in um, the time of the Buddha, which is around the time of Socrates, by the way. Jainism is why well, I put it in bold because it's really interesting, right? The Indian idea of ahimsa, non-violence, himsa is violence, ahimsa, non-violence, right, comes from the Jains. Like Jain priests walk with a feather broom, a broom with very gentle feathers on the edge of it, brushing the path that they walk along so they won't accidentally step on a tiny insect that they might not even see. That's how into nonviolence they are. And they're vegetarians. And so the, the, the idea of nonviolence that Mahatma Gandhi got, I mean, it's in yoga philosophy, it's in all sorts of India, but I think it got its most powerful expression among the Jains. The Jains are known to be peaceful. So um, to be pacifists, I go a step further, not just peaceful, but pacifists. They believe in nonviolence to the tilt, to the to the nines, as we say. Right. And then there's this doctrine, Anikantavada. The A in front of it means not. Um, and I forget exactly what ekanta means, but vada means path or way or school of thought. Right. And I think it means something like non-singular right? Uh, a non-singular or a non, yeah, non-solo, non-singular. So they, uh, they don't believe that any one view is correct, right? So it's a view that all views are, the plurality, a multitude of views are all correct in some sense. Why? Because every being has a mind and that mind and senses are perceiving reality and that's forming a picture in their mind. And that picture is valid to a degree based on their experience and their perspective and where they're situated and how the world looks from that angle, right? So it's like everybody at a different angle looking at the same object sees different things, right? Like the elephant and the 10 blind men, right? All feeling it. One feels the tusk, the other one feels the ear, another one feels the tail, one feels the leg, one feels the belly, the trunk, and each describes it as different things, a tree trunk, a snake, a spear, you know, and so on, right? Um, those are all valid perceptions, right? This is a Jain idea about the doctrine of pluralism, a kind of uh, epistemological pluralism, you might want to say, that uh, everybody's cognitive perspective has validity to it, right? Now, that view is what supports their ethics of nonviolence, because just because we all view things differently doesn't mean we need to fight about it, right? Now, wouldn't it be nice if the world religions that have fought each other had that view, all right? I give a lot of credit to the Jains. It's a wonderful, wonderful idea to remember. It doesn't mean that there are no truths, right? So let me back up a little bit. It doesn't mean that there's no one truth. There is a reality, but everybody's perceiving it from a different angle, Right. But maybe there's this other idea that the more we learn about everybody else's angles, then the more we know about the one reality. Right. So it's not relativism completely. It's partial relativism. Right. We had that in um, with Aristotle. Right. So things are relative to the individual. Like what makes something a good knife depends on the purpose of that utensil. It's a utensil. It's designed to cut. So if it's sharp and pointy, then it's a good knife. Right. So and same thing with relative to a human, what are the virtues of a human, right? So this is similar to the, in the way, in that way, it doesn't like the word good is relative, but also objective. It's objectively true that a sharp knife is a good knife, right? Right. So that kind of thing. So there's a blend of relative and non-relative in Aristotle's um, ethics, right? Same thing here in Jane epistemology. There's a relativism, but also an objectivism. Right, because if the, the more information you have from the more and more views from everywhere, 
then you get the kind of absolute view or closer and closer to the absolutely objectively true view of the thing, okay? Um, all right. Buddhism rejects the caste system. Buddha lived around the time also of uh, those fatalists because he argued with them around the time of Socrates. But um, we'll, we'll have a whole, at least one whole week unit on Buddhism. So I won't say much more about it, except to point out that Buddha rejected the caste system, in which case anybody could escape from where they were in the caste system and become a Buddhist, um, which is a kind of social mobility thing, or at least freedom from the oppression of being in a particular caste you don't want to be in. Right. And then there was these materialists, just like we have atheist materialists today, the scientists who only believe in matter and there's no such thing as a soul. Right. They had them back then too, the Carvaca or Charvaca. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I've heard it both ways. OK, important point to make. And I'm going to kind of speed it up because I, I have to go in about 19 minutes for another meeting. It's in Indian philosophy and Indian religion. There's no conflict between religion and philosophy. It's Indian religion and philosophy, not versus philosophy, right? They're inseparable. And they share this, a, a few things. They, all, they both try to understand the ultimate reality, the true self, whatever that is, how to live, how should you live your life, what's the meaning of life, all that sort of thing, right? And in Indian philosophy, in Indian religion, you're, you're supposed to question, you know? It's a philosophical religious system, right? There are widespread assumptions, however, that are often not questioned, right? Like karma and reincarnation. That's almost universal, except among the materialists, right? The Karvakas, right? But Rita, the cosmic order, Dharma, your role based on your caste, God's existence, just like in Judaism, right? The Talmudic scholars are highly philosophical, right? But they don't question whether or not God exists. They question how do we interpret what God said and what he did, that kind of thing, right? Similar here. OK, but just like Talmudic scholars are very philosophical, like Maimonides, right, or Catholic theologian philosophers like Aquinas or St. Augustine, uh, who we talked about, the Neo Neoplatonic influences on Augustine from Pl Plotinus, right? You've got this highly philosophical religion. Right. But the average person chanting to Krishna, washing her clothes in the Ganges River might not have a bone, a philosophical ounce in her body. You know, who knows? Um, or some truck driver, you know, whatever. Um, OK, so but the, ten, the, the, the tension between religion and philo the, the strong strains of philosophy in Indian religion create a tension between belief, faith and reason. And so generates these things like Buddhism, and, you know, changes, you know, generation after generation. It's kind of built into it. When you intertwine religion and philosophy that strongly, you're going to have change over time, change in belief systems. And like I said, these different schools debate each other over the centuries. OK, so I have a picture of like cognitive tools, your cognitive, your epistemological toolkit over there. Right. So uh, this, it's there for a reason. What's the goal of Indian philosophy? To know the ultimate truth, the self. Right. And if you have the right kind of view, the darshan, the perspective, the vision, then you've got the right kind of map so you can try to figure out how to get there, right? Having the right view, if you have the wrong map, you're going to get lost, right? So that's why they battle over what the right view is, right? But each view dictates certain, like, if this is where you think the goal is, then, that, then you think this is how you get to that goal, by going this way, by using this technique, right? So... The different schools of thought in Indian philosophy have different methods of trying to attain enlightenment, right, or reaching the goal, different tools, spiritual, psychological, mental, meditative, yogic tools are different paths to that same kind of goal, right, like yoga and meditation, right? So the idea, why are these tools so prominent in Asian philosophy, meditation and yoga and things like that? They are believed that you, you sharpen your, your tools. Your soul is in here. Reality is out there. What's separating your soul and your mind from reality and truth is some kind of mistaken structuring of your toolkit, your philosophical, spiritual toolkit. You need to fix your tools, right? Sharpen your knowing tools, your knowledge tools, 
right? Oh, and then there's this model um, about meditation. When the mind calms down, it's like a lake. When all the waves stop and the lake becomes totally still, all the, the mud particles settle to the bottom, all the bubbles rise to the top and come out into the air and the water becomes perfectly still. The surface becomes like a sheet of glass. You can see clear through to the bottom, but the surface like a sheet of glass functions like a mirror and reflects the moon and the moon symbolizes reality, right? So by clarifying your mind and fixing your cognitive equipment, then you can perceive reality without these confusions, right? You need to sharpen your toolkit, right? That's what's going on in like the yoga philosophies of India, okay? Calibrate your cognitive equipment first, right? Like the scale needs to be calibrated just before you step on it. If the needle's not on zero, you have to adjust the dial till the needle goes on zero. You've calibrated your scale, right? You need to calibrate your cognitive tools, your mind, so that it can perceive reality, right? That's what meditation is. Clearing and cleaning the mind so that it can perceive this ultimate reality. Then you can see it. You can view it yourself, right? It's available to anyone who will try. And in this system, yogis who claim to have done this, they are considered like the rishis, the seers who wrote the Vedas in a sense, because they are seeing and hearing directly. It's called yogic perception, and that is considered valid in Indian epistemology, right? The claims of yogis who enter deep states of meditation and claim that they're at one with the universe their statements count as valid evidence of the reality of that other way of looking at things, right? And their philosophical analyses, right, what the yogis who have these experiences say and the philosophers who analyze them, those are, they yield criteria for what counts as knowledge and also relying on the logic school, Nyaya, right? So epistemology first, right? That's, that's one of the things the ways of understanding why yoga and meditation are so important in the system is because you got to do that first. If you want to learn yourself and not just take it on faith, but what other people say, you've got to do it yourself. It's a do it yourself kit, right? It's a skill. It's a kind of knowing how to ride a bike, knowing how to perceive ultimate reality or the unity of the soul with God. There's a way to do it. Right, so you have to fix the way to do it first. You have to sharpen your tools. You, it's epistemology first, knowing how to know reality. You have to get the knowing how part done right, and that's yoga and meditation. Right, the metaphysics comes second. How do you know what's real if you don't know how to know first? So once you know how to know, right, then what reality is, how reality is, right, what is true, that's that's when you can figure that out. So epistemology first, meditation. Metaphysics, what, what's the reality you perceive when you get your epistemology right? This is on Rapetti's analysis. Okay, so some famous gurus and teachers, acharyas. Right? The acharya is a pundit. It's a kind of storyteller. Right? This story is generation after generation around the fire, right? the puja, right? stories to gurus, teachers. They, they, they tell stories uh, from the history, their tradition, they have a meditation, they'll have a puja, etc. This is the way that this is done, right? Come and sit near, like in the Upanishads. It's an oral transmission, generation after generation. And in every generation, there are gurus and yogis and saints that appear and avatars that are believed to walk the earth, right? Right up until the present, right? From guru to chela, chela means disciple. For thousands of years, this has been going on. Many, many, many threads or lineages of this have been going on for thousands of years, right? Oh, and the Brahmins, right? From age seven, the kids have to memorize thousands of lines of text from, from these, the, the Vedas and the Upanishads, right? Not all Brahmins are gurus, right? A guru is a considered like an enlightened being, right? Like a Jesus type character, right? Uh, and vice versa. Not all gurus are Brahmins. Somebody might be just an ordinary person. They have some kind of vision. They have an enlightenment experience and they become considered an overnight holy man, right? Or woman. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about this Shruti versus Smriti, right? So this is the uh, Smriti part of it, right? 
the gurus and their disciples, the chain of them, what was remembered and transmitted, heard and repeated, right? As opposed to what was originally, right? We'll go, this all goes back to the Vedas in this belief system, right? Which are like biblical, right? But Smriti, what's remembered is still sacred and it's respected, okay? It continues to today. So now we go to the modern era in the 1800s, common era, a little hundred years ago or so, this guy, Ramakrishna, um, that's one word named after two gods, Rama and Krishna, and Sri means something like his holiness. That's a respectful title. An intense devotional seeker. That's what's distinctive about him, right? His heart was burning for God. He would cry out to God. He said, if you cry out to God like a baby crying out for its mother, the mother, the goddess, you know, can't ignore you, right? And so it's like Jesus saying, blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. Right. Ramakrishna took that line and ran with it. Right. And he just tried to like love God and want God. And he claimed that he tried all these different paths, like Jewish practices, Christian practices, Islamic practices, all the different Hindu paths. He said every single one of them worked and brought him to a vision of God. Right. But he especially is a devotee of the divine mother. He was just a, a lover of this model that God as mother. Oh, and that's an interesting thing, because this is what, what Krishna says, something like this in the Gita, in the Bhagavad Gita. Every relationship, or it's in the philosophy, and mother and child, lover and lover, uh, any relationship that human beings can have with each other, God has come in that form and been in that kind of relationship with someone, right? So um, it's like God is in everything, right? So it kind of makes sense. But so his favorite form of God was the divine mother, represented as the goddess Kali, right? Oh, and by the way, he founded the Vedanta Mission or the Vedanta Society. There's one in Manhattan, if you want to go and check it out. It's a pretty cool place. Been there. I, I haven't been there in a long time. I think it's still there. But he's a beloved guy. And his devotee, one of his, his leading student was a fellow named Vivekananda. A Swami is a kind of wandering holy man, but it's, a, it's like a priesthood. You know, you get initiated into it and there's rules about being a Swami and everything. And um, Great philosopher Vivekananda wrote many books on. I told you about a fourth kind of yoga. So in the in the Gita, as it's called, often the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, the God, says there's karma yoga, right? Do what you do, no matter what your role is in life: parent, bus driver, uh, warrior. Do your dharma and don't worry about your karma. Leave your karma to me. I'll take care of it. That's your path to God. You do your duty. I got you. Right, because all roads lead to me. I am all gods, Krishna even says. I'm every religion. I am every path, right? And I'm every soul. It's all me, right? So that's that philosophy. But um, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, the path of devotion. Rama Krishna was a bhakti, a lover of God, right? A god intoxicant, intoxicated by the love of God. That's bhakti yoga. Um, modern chanting is becoming very popular, and we'll have something on that later. Um, and then I might have to make a part two on this if I run out of time. Yeah, we'll see. <sighs> Yana, G-N-A-N-A -N -A or J-N-A-N-A. Jnana, -N -A. Jnana is the path of knowledge, right? Well, this guy, Vivekananda said, well, yeah, let's break the path down. There's also Raja Yoga, which is just a meditation path. It's got eight steps in it, right? It includes postures, moral rules, breathing exercises and meditation techniques. That's the royal road. Raja means king, like the Maharaj, I told you, right? So that's the kingly yoga or the royal, the royal path. It's got eight limbs. Ashta means eight. Anga means limbs. Eight limbs. Akto in Greek. Ashta, right? See the similarity? Eight limbs of yoga. One of the first yogis, by the way, to visit the West um, was Vivekananda. Ramana Maharshi, another famous guy. Um, advocate of Advaita, non-dualism, right? Non-dualistic Vedanta from the, the latter Vedas, the Upanishads. It's called the method of self-inquiry. Who am I? What am I? And his meditations uh, encourage you to think of a part of your body, let's just say my hands. And if I lost my hands, am I my hands? Would I still exist without my hand? Yes. And you go through your entire body, you do this for every single one. And the answer is neti neti, meaning not this, not, I am not this, I am not this. You do your mind, you do your memory, you do your personality, you do all, every little thing that you might think that you are. And then all of those are not neti, 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 not this, not. And what's left? Brahman, that's it. The Atman, the soul. I am what? What am I? I am that, the, the one, the all, 
tattvamasi in Sanskrit, right? The Atman, the self, is Brahman, is the one. It's That's who your true self is, okay? That's him. Paramahansa Yogananda wrote a book. I highly encourage you to do it, read it, um, or even read a chapter of it. Maybe we'll do an extra credit thing on that. Maybe I'll assign some chapters from that book. You can get it for free on the internet, I think. Autobiography of a Yogi, that book really influenced me. One of my favorite guys. And he founded this organization all over the world called Self-Realization Fellowship, SRF. And they have a place in Manhattan also that I used to go to, which I really love. Okay, here's a great philosopher of the 20th century, Sarvapelli Radhakrishnan, former president of India, great philosopher, a Vedantist, right? Argues that all mystical experiences are of the same thing. So every prophet or mystic who founded any religion or religious movement had the same experience, but that's beyond the mind, it's beyond words because it's non-dualistic and mental states are all dualistic, right? Words are all dualistic. Words mean this versus that. Otherwise they all mean the same thing, right? So he says, everybody has the same experience when they come back into their ordinary mind and try to explain it, language can't capture it. That's what ineffable means. It means indescribable, right? So the descriptions are always faulty and then religions are formed and they go by those descriptions. Our description is not the, it's similar to his, but we're right and he's wrong. And it's all the same. This is this Catholic attitude, uh, not the Catholic church, but the word Catholic meaning universal, right? All religions derive from the one, from the same being. Stop arguing about it, right? You could have the experience yourself. That's the idea. Okay, Krishnamurti, Jiddu Krishnamurti. Um, there's a mystical society called the Theosophical Society. It's a kind of blend of Indian type religions and other mystical paths and philosophies, uh, very into the occult and all this. And they had a, a prophecy that a Messiah was going to be born and they thought it was him. And they, they found him as a kid for the astrologers or whatever, or whatever reason they thought he was the one and they raised him, they brought him in and raised him in a monastic lifestyle and you know, <coughs> taught him the scriptures and yoga and meditation and this and that. And, and when he was an adult and finally come out to give his first speech, his speech was, I'm not your Messiah. Don't look for Messiahs. Find the truth in yourself. And, th and th don't separate spirituality from ordinary life. Just like if you're angry, meditate on your anger, right? Like acknowledge all your limitations. Like just be honest with yourself, right? He has a really fascinating, I love this guy. So I'm mentioning him. And he's considered a, he's considered a, a kind of enlightened being in Indian philosophy. Okay. Okay. Nim Karoli Baba. I'm going to have to pause this and come back. Yeah, because I'm going to run out of time. But I will just say, I mentioned Maharaji earlier that he's a modern saint. And Ramdas in the top picture is the guy looking up at him. And in the bottom picture, the guy on the left is Krishna Das, right? And I've got, uh, you know, maybe I'll let you go ahead and watch those videos yourself. And maybe I can end this on time. Yes, that's what I'm going to do. Or I'll put, I'll put those links up separately, but you can just replay the PowerPoint, and then find the links to those. I want you to go see them both, just to have a taste that this tradition is alive and well. And I know both of those people, Ram Das, who passed away about a year or two years ago, and, and Krishna Das is a friend of mine. Um, I belong to a spiritual community or with those people. Okay, so here's just some pictures of Hindu gods uh, that's Goddess Kali in the middle with the next to the monkey god. Uh, in the very middle, you've got Hanuman on the left and the goddess Kali on the right. She's below Jesus. Um, the upper left-hand corner is Krishna. Just below Krishna is Ganesh, the elephant guy. There's autobiography of a yogi, Yogananda. There's Ram Das to his right. There's somebody in prayer pose. And the furthest right, the guy with the afro is Sai Baba, who's considered an incarnation of God. And Hilda Charlton was his devotee. She was one of my first, my first meditation teacher. And above both of them is a guy named Shirdi Sai Baba, who's a Muslim and a Hindu saint, um, and Buddha up in the center. Okay, and that's it. So good, I didn't have to do part two, but I am going to stop the share, say goodbye. I'll see you guys next time. I hope this was useful. Go ahead and find those links. All right.